<laughs> all right welcome everybody to the end game class today and uh, it's gonna be a little bit different i have my daughter here with me so uh we're gonna go over the, the this game i actually played in the at the chess club here in the u.s chess league finals against dallas in 2005 and my opponent is grandmaster uh well he was international master at that time uh Ru Feng lee so here we have a French defense, knight c3. So we have the, you know, classical violation of the French. And I decided to play knight f6. Here he responded with bishop g5. And now, here, what are my options here? I have here a few alternatives here, okay? So I would like you to tell me the, my alternatives here for black. Yes, Jovan. Um, takes g4 because b4 and bishop g7. Exactly. You can take d takes e4 which is the Rubenstein variation. You can play bishop b7, the, the classical setup, or you can play bishop b4, which is known as? The, um, it's got a really interesting name. What is the name of the bishop b4 line? McCutcheon. McCutcheon, yeah. McCutcheon line. Mm -hmm. So I took only four. Now he plays knight e4. Now, bishop e7 I chose. I also sometimes play knight bd7 here, but here I chose just bishop e7 line. Now he goes here. Bishop takes f6. Now I take back g takes f6. Knight f3. Developing. So this is all theory still. So I played f5, knight c3, a6. You don't want to play c5 here quickly because if you play c5, for example, you're going to be. c5 is going to be met by a strong response d5. Oops. We have something. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay. So, so he played queen e2 here. Again, you don't want to play c5 immediately here because you're going to be met by a strong d5. Okay? So, like, if you do this, this is not going to be good because he has e5. Sorry. Something. So, I played a6. And now he played bishop queen e2. The idea is if you play c5, this is going to be met by d5 again. So I play b5. Okay, let me see if I can turn off this coordinates because, okay. All right, that's fine. Uh, so I play the move b5. What is my idea after b5? What am I trying to achieve in this position? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Bishop before. So now he played long castle. And now he is gearing up. He is gearing up to play the move d5. So this move needs to be stopped. This move has to be stopped. It needs to be prevented, okay? How? How we are going to do that? How we are going to prevent that? Yes. We can play c6, but I wanted first to attack him. Attack the knight to make him move. Now I want to take. So now he goes here. Knight to a4. Now he goes knight to a4. And now we continue with our development. Queen d5. This move will prevent him from playing d5. And we'll activate our queen. And now we are attacking something. What are we attacking here, everybody? Yeah, we are attacking the a2 pawn. Queen takes a2. There are a few different options here. He chose queen c4. If he goes king b1, I just go knight d7 and continue with bishop, bishop b7. This is what I'm trying to do. And I go... Yeah, something like this, bishop b7 and queen b5. And black is, black is doing fine here. Okay? So that's why he played uh, queen to c4. Activating his queen and now proposing the exchange. I don't want to take because, uh, well, if I take, the problem is he has bishop takes. And now d5 I have to deal with, which is a very strong idea. Okay? So d5 I have to deal with, it's very, very strong idea. So, so that's why I don't uh, want to do that. 
So here, I decided that I should just play bishop b7. And if he captures on d5, I go bishop takes, bishop to d5. And again, why black wants to prevent the d5 break in this position. This is the main idea, to try to prevent d5. But, okay, this involves a, a sacrifice. Okay, so he takes my pawn. And uh, it seems like, wait a minute, where is the pawn? Where is the pawn here? Now we're down a pawn. What are we going to do? But this is a positional, positional sacrifice, okay? Now, what should I do? What should black do in this position? They need to shoot him now. You want? Well, I have to go bishop d6 first to attack the queen. Now he goes here. Yeah, no, Tina. Now, because if he goes to b6, I have knight d7. So he goes here, I go knight d7, just developing now. He takes, bishop takes d5. Now attacking on f3 and also on a2 as well. I'm down a pawn here, but my bishops are very strong, okay? Now he goes b3. Now he goes b3. Now, Yovan? Yeah, I played rook g8 because I want to put pressure. Yeah, this way I'm putting pressure. What's going to happen in this Tina? Yeah. But because the rook on g8 will put pressure on g2. Now, I play rook g because I want to put pressure on g2, and if he develops the bishop, I can take. So it's very difficult, even though he is up a pawn, it's very difficult for white to move. Now he played knight e1. Now he goes knight e1. What to do? Now, what should I do here? Change I decided to go king e7. That way I can connect my rooks. Okay? I mean, I can play h5, but I think it's just better to connect the rooks because I can play h5 a little bit later on, okay? Now he goes here. Bishop to e2. And I cannot take. For example, if you think you're going to take this, it's a problem because he's going to take and, and rook take. So I cannot take because take, take, yes, bishop f3. Now, what should I do? Yes. I play rook a d8. Mm -hmm. 
bishop f3, I take. If he takes with the knight, I take on g2. So he has to take back with the pawn, but now his pawn structure is damaged. Okay? And now I go check. And look at this move, 95. Now, this move actually puts him in a pretty difficult spot here, because now what to do? There is a pressure on ft, there is a pressure on default, there is a control of the open g file. Okay? And if you go knight d3, I have rook takes d4. So it's a tricky, tricky situation here. What to do, okay? Knight d3, I have rook takes d4. So, what should you do here? And that's on the TTR, it's gonna have the upper limit TTR. TTR upper limit. Yeah, as you can see, it's very hard to move for white. His pieces cannot move, even though he's up a pawn, but he's got a lot of weaknesses. H2, F3, H, everything is weak. Then he chats with him, as it suggests. Yes, you're one. Well, then he through us. Knight b6 is a possibility, but uh, so where are you trying to go with the knight on b6? C4. Where? C4. Any chat through? Yeah, it's an idea. He played c4, he tried to break open this way. So I took knight c3. Yeah, that's in. Now he goes knight c3. Now, what is the next option here? Now, what should I be doing here? What should I do here? I'm still down the pawn. Yes, you're one. H5. H5 is an idea. What else? H5 is interesting. You're one. What else? Exactly. Excellent thinking. Yes. Knight c6. Now we're attacking the d4 pawn. Now he goes knight c2 to protect it. And now that gives us an opportunity to activate which piece? That gives you an opportunity to activate which piece? Now, rook g2. Now this attacks f2. Yeah, I'll see you. Tina, stop. Now what to do? Rook g2 now attacking on f2 and h2. So he goes d5. Now he decided to make a break. 
So he plays d5. So now what to do? I don't want to take because he has knight d5, right? Well, we can go back, but it's better to go here because we want to attack on f3. Oh, back to e5, correct. Knight goes rook d4. Now the bishop is under attack. So I decided to take on f2. For a moment, leaving my bishop hanging. But can you see why? Can you see why I can do that? Can you see why I can afford to give up my bishop? Yes. Correct. So I took, he took, rook c8, quiet move. Now I'm attacking both rooks, okay? So he decided, you know, he cannot also play the move king b2. Jovan, why? Knight d3 check, picks up the rook. So he cannot move the king up because of that. So it's a little bit uh, tricky, but it's in the end game, you know? See, there's still tactics in the end game. So he goes rook c4. I took, he took, I took. And now he goes king b2, see? He's not losing a knight this way, but I am getting a lot of pawns, which is gonna be important. And the knights are not particularly very strong in this position. So now, which pawn we want to capture here? Correct. Knight d1. Well, that's what he wants. He wants you to take and split up your pawns. I don't want to split up my pawns. I'm working. So I could push it, but I want, I played here. Putting, I want that h2 pawn because if I win the h2 pawn, then I can push my h pawn as well. I could have an outside pass pawn. So it was knight e3. Rook h3. Now look at that. He should have gone knight f1 here, keep the pawns, but he, oh, actually he did knight f1, sorry. Rook f4. He took. I was happy to see this capture because now I have two connected pass pawns and he has no pass pawn. Rook f2. Threatening to take on h2. He decided that if he plays knight f1, I'm just going to continue pushing, you know. So he goes here. Takes. Now I just push. When you have two rooks like that very strong on a second rank, you can continue pushing the h pawn. Now my plan is to play h4 and h3. Just continue pushing the h pawn. Okay. King b1 h4 knight c4 again i don't see any thing he can do here so now we're going to go for simplification which simplification you just have to calculate here the reason it's good to have an outside pass pawn because it's much harder for him to stop it okay it's much harder for him to stop the outside pass pawn Huh? Perfect. He takes. Just push, right? 
And his knight, his knight cannot get there. His knight can, he is just too far away from stopping the pawn. And that's why I was so focused, as you can see earlier in the game, to try to win the H pawn because the central pawns are nice, but the knights are right there in the middle. It's going to be harder to promote the central pawns. But outside pawn, I knew it. It will be much easier because then it will be very difficult for the knights to defend. So that's why I wanted to win the H2 pawn. Okay. So that's why I went for this position. Okay. In fact, um, he probably could have defended a little bit better. He could have maybe done something, but uh, th this is probably a very difficult position for him uh, because my both of my rooks are very active, and two knights are not that strong in this kind of positions. In which kind of positions you would say the two knights would be strong? If there are more pawns on the board, if there are more pawns on the board and the character of the position is more closed. If the character is closed, then the knights could be dominating. But in an open board like this, where uh, you know the, the knights are not very effective because they can only check, and in this position they cannot even check. So this is an example for you where two knights are actually quite weak, instead of being strong here. Okay, so, and that's why I concentrate. I concentrated on winning the H pawn. I think I do believe that he should have probably just tried to keep the knight there. That would have made my task a little bit more difficult. Okay, probably still is winning. I was gonna go rook f2 and try to push, but by by doing this, he made it easier for me. Now, I have pressure on c2, and I just push. Uh, perhaps he could have maybe done something else, not to allow rook c2, but I don't see what he can do, because if he plays like even knight f1, what would be the best way to win this game? Yeah, I could, but I can just go rook h1, I think. Knight f1. Yeah, yeah, okay. So here I just push. So if knight f1, simply rook comes to h1, putting pressure here. So yeah, but the game ended, uh, as you can see, like this. I took, and here he resigned. In fact, yeah, this was a very good win because it helped us to, to win the finals and win the U.S. Chess League. Okay, all right, that was the game against Riff and Lee. So it's a French defense, Rubenstein variation. I'm gonna show you one position. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let me close this one. We're using the new chess space, so it works a little bit differently than the old one, let's see. Okay. So we're going to do one uh, bishop endgame. That's one of my favorite bishop endgame positions. Since this class is on endgames. So. Okay, we're looking at this from the white perspective. We're about one square away from queening. Okay? But it it's, it's very hard to do it. Okay? It's very hard to do it, and you have to use a spe special method here to be able to win this position. Because you promote the pawn, he's going to sacrifice for it. His king is very, black king is very active. So what method we can use here to win this game? So I want to give you some time to think. So we're going to pause here for a few minutes and see if you can find this solution the plan for white to win this.
Okay. We had a couple of minutes to think, so let's see if you have any thoughts here. Johan. Bishop G5 or Bishop H4, for example. Yeah. What is the plan? What is the plan? Well, um, plan is to go to H7 and D8, but the thing is, he has king over and time to stop it. So what you need to do in this position is to um, force it, is to force the bishop out out of the same location on H2, so that whenever you um, decide to actually implement the plan of bringing the bishop to B8. Okay, well let's let's see. Let's 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 see the concrete moves. Bishop page four. Yeah, if I don't do anything, you're gonna be able to win because of this. Okay? And you're gonna go here and you're gonna go bishop two b eight. Okay? And this is a win because you're gonna kick the bishop from a long diagonal, you're gonna go here, and then you're gonna get him out of here with the bishop g1 okay so you're gonna be good in this he takes you're gonna promote into a queen but the problem is when you do this he's gonna go here And then you're gonna go check, and he's gonna go here. So he's not gonna make it. He's not gonna make it easy for you to do it. You're one. Bishop G one. Mm -mm. Better. Okay, do we see the plan here? This next move is very, very important, okay? Without the next move, you're not gonna be able to win this game. So I wanna give you a little bit time to think here so you can find the correct move here. What is the correct move? Let's see. You're one. Huh? No. Better. You want to control the d6 square. This is very important, okay? So he doesn't have the d6 square, the bishop. So that gives you a hint what might be the first move. Ok, 
Okay. Bishop c5 again. He cannot move the king because you have bishop a7, bishop b8. So he has to go bishop g3. Bishop e7. Bishop e7. Now we are taking bishop d8, bishop c7. Winning the game. So he has to go here. Bishop d8 check. He goes king c6. Now we go bishop h4, attacking the bishop. If he takes, I go b8 queen. Okay? If he takes, I go b8 queen. So, not gonna work. So he has to go bishop to a7, bishop f2, bishop to c5, bishop a7, bishop to a7. Now, bishop b8. Now we're accomplishing our task of removing the bishop from a long diagonal. So it has to go bishop g1, bishop g3, bishop a7. And now we go bishop to f2. And it captures, we promote. We finally managed to remove the bishop from guarding the b8 square, okay? So after some very important maneuvering, you're gonna be able to win this. So a very important end game to know. Without it, you're not gonna be able to win this game, okay? What was wrong with bishop g1 or bishop e Uh, when, here? Yes. Sorry. So, so bishop g1 here, or just go here? Yeah, now, yeah, I, I don't you think bishop should... Yeah, well, yeah, I think you can get back to the same position, but I don't think you're accomplishing that much, you know? I don't think you're accomplishing that much by playing bishop g1 because he still remains on the long diagonal. Nothing, you're just ma not making progress, that's what the, the whole... So that's why y you need to go bishop c5 in this position. By playing bishop g1, bishop f2, you're not damaging the position, but you're not also making any progress because he will stay on that diagonal. In order to do it, you have to play the move bishop g5 to make progress, okay? So that's a very important end game for you, and at the end, we'll do for the final position. It was a very important king and pawn position. Uh, some of you might know this position. But it's, it's, a, it's an excellent example of the king and pawn endgame. White to play and draw. When you're down a pawn in a king and pawn endgame, 90% of the time, you're very likely you're going to lose the game. Okay? Down a pawn, in, it means that you're in serious trouble. But here, there is a very nice idea you have to be able to make a draw. Okay, okay. What's the idea? One second. Let's let's see. King h1. The idea of king h1 is is giving you what kind of opposition? Distant opposition. Okay. It's a, it's an odd number of squares between both kings, so it gives you a distant opposition here. Okay. So now king h1, I go king d2. What do you do to keep that opposition? King h2, king d3, king h3, king e3, king g3, king e2, correct, king e1.
king d1, king h1. And now you just keep doing that, king e1, king g1, king e2, king g2. Now it goes g4, the last attempt to make things complicated. Now what do you do? Correct. If take the e-pawn is going to queen. Yeah, with a check, and you're going to lose. So that's why you have to go king g2. Now if takes, takes, you go king e4, king e5. So he has to go king d2. And if he does that, what do we play? Take the pawn. He push. And you quit. All right. Okay, excellent. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for joining the class. And we'll be back next Tuesday with more endgame coverage for you, okay? Okay, bye-bye. Okay, okay.